nerve pain, burning, sharp, sensitive, electric pain, regardless of the cause, peripheral neuropathy, central nervous system diseases like spinal cord injury or multiple sclerosis, the most common drug treatment is gabapentin. In this video, I'll explain how it works, the efficacy and randomized controlled trials against placebo and other nerve pain drugs, the side effects, special dosing in people with chronic kidney disease, and drug-drug interactions. Gabapentin was originally branded as Neurontin and has been FDA approved since 1993, but is long generic and there are other brand names as shown here. It's excreted by the kidneys into the urine and hence the dosing is different in people with chronic kidney disease as will be discussed later. It has a relatively short half-life, only five to seven hours, so it's typically taken three times a day, morning, afternoon, and evening, and usually it becomes effective over time. It doesn't provide instantaneous pain relief. The dose is very widely in an elderly person with chronic kidney disease, I might give a very conservative dose of 100 milligrams just once at night, but some people take ridiculously high doses of this drug, such as 1800 milligrams three times daily, which is actually over the max recommended dose, but some people can tolerate it, though it can be quite sedating. This video is actually inspired by a relative of mine who takes gabapentin for nerve pain that is taking 600 milligrams three times a day. Typically, people may start 100 to 300 milligrams three times daily and then increase the dose as needed. Gabapentin is structurally similar to GABA, the neurotransmitter gamma-alpha-butyric acid. You can see the only difference is this benzene ring. GABA is the target of drugs like alcohol, benzodiazepines, clonopin and adivant, or barbiturates like phenobarbital, but this has nothing to do with how gabapentin works despite the similar name because it does not bind the GABA receptor or have any any activity there at all. In reality, it's thought to work on calcium channels, alpha-2, delta-1, L-type calcium channels involved in rapid nervous transmission, believed to have some involvement in nerve pain. The same drug is used for various other things, including partial onset epilepsy. By the way, my name is Brandon Bieber, and as a conflict of interest statement, I do work with a medical group that in 2010 successfully sued Pfizer, the manufacturer of Neurontin, for dubious marketing practices. I'm not sure if I benefited from that, just putting it out there. Nonetheless, I do prescribe this medication quite frequently, but I could be biased, so talk to your own provider for personalized advice. Let's move to the results of clinical trials. This is a study in post-herpetic neuralgia. These are people who get shingles, a painful rash, and unfortunately develop chronic pain afterwards. And this study compares gabapentin 3,600 milligrams a day, in other words, 1,200 milligrams three times a day versus placebo. They used a zero to 10 pain scale, 10 being the most pain, zero being no pain. And the dark triangles are gabapentin and the placebo is the clear circles. And you can see they started out about equal and people taking gabapentin did better by about two points on the pain scale by week eight. And the separation took around three weeks. So the drug didn't work instantaneously, but taken continuously continuously for three weeks, it was moderately effective. Here's another study, also post-herpetic neuralgia, but they used lower doses, so gabapentin 1800 milligrams, in other words, 600 milligrams three times a day, or 2400 milligrams a day, or placebo, and here both doses did better than placebo, but the benefit was a little more modest, about 1 to 1.5 on the pain scale, but it was effective. Another way to look at it is, how many people get at least 50% reduction? in pain. So these are the same two studies I just showed you. Here the gray is gabapentin and the white is placebo. So in the first study, 29% taking gabapentin had at least 50% pain reduction. Not that great, but versus only 12% with placebo. In the other study, it was 32 and 34% with the two doses of gabapentin versus 14%, at least 50% pain reduction in placebo. So most people don't have a major reduction in pain. Most people just have a modest reduction in pain, which is consistent with my clinical experience, although I find most people are happy to get any reduction in pain as long as they have no side effects from the drug. Another lesson is these are relatively high doses, so for people who are not getting any result but have no side effects and taking a modest dose like 300 milligrams three times a day, if it's a young person with good kidneys, I would just advise increasing the dose. This is a meta-analysis, again, in post-herpetic neuralgia of seven random 
randomized trials of gabapentin versus placebo. In this plot, anything to the right suggests that gabapentin is effective, and you can see there's a trend towards gabapentin being better in all seven studies. In the conglomerate, the p-value is highly statistically significant, less than 0.00001. No question the drug is effective, though the effect is modest, at least 50% pain reduction in 33% with gabapentin versus 19% with placebo. Another way to look at it is the number needed to treat. In other words, how many people do I need to give the drug to to achieve at least 50% pain reduction in one person? The answer is about seven, six. Which is not great, although others could have a more modest pain reduction. What about a different condition? This is a meta-analysis for diabetic neuropathy. Diabetes can damage the peripheral nerves, cause numbness and tingling, and sometimes burning and sharp pain in the fingers and toes. This is a study of six different randomized trials, gabapentin versus placebo, various doses. Anything to the right on this plot suggests gabapentin was beneficial, and in the conglomerate, again, it was highly statistically significant, P less than 0.0001, though it was a modest benefit, at least 50% pain intensity reduction in 38% with gabapentin versus 23% with placebo, a number needed to treat of 6.6. Now we move to a comparison against other nerve pain medications. This is a meta-analysis of gabapentinoids against tricyclic antidepressants. So here they combined two gabapentinoids gabapentin and pregabalin, which is Lyrica, very similar to gabapentin, though the dosing is different, believed to be equal in efficacy. Tricyclic antidepressants are drugs that block norepinephrine uptake, and they are a nortriptyline, for example, and amitriptyline. They can have side effects such as dry mouth and sedation, and they can be dangerous with overdose, so maybe the side effect profile is a little bit worse than with gabapentin, unless you have pain at night or you also have insomnia and like the sedation effect, for example. And here they looked at seven different studies, and anything to the right suggests that the tricyclic antidepressant is better. And you can see one study favored the gabapentinoid, one study was about the same, and several studies slightly favored the tricyclic antidepressants. When you put it all together, there was no statistically significant difference, maybe slight trend favoring the tricyclic antidepressants, but about equally effective. The p-value was 0.08 eight, not statistically significant. This top chart is anyone who responded at all got any improvement. The bottom is at least 50% pain reduction, and the results were about the same. Again, no statistically significant differences. What about SNRIs, serotonin, norepinephrine, reuptake inhibitors? These are drugs such as venlafaxine, Effexor, or duloxetine, Cymbalta, and they only have three studies in this meta-analysis. Again, the top chart is treatment responders, people who got at all better, and the bottom is at least 50% pain reduction. And anything to the right suggests that the SNRI was superior to gabapentin or pregabalin. And one of the three studies did suggest that the SNRI was better, which was duloxetine 60 milligrams, but the other two studies didn't show that. And as a whole, there was no statistically significant difference for either analysis. So in summary, gabapentinoids such as gabapentin and pregabalin are roughly equally effective in treating nerve pain as tricyclic antidepressants and SNRIs. Of course, gabapentin is used for various other forms of nerve pain, not just postherpetic neuralgia and diabetic neuropathy. This is a small, open-label study in people with multiple sclerosis. Only 23 people with a relatively modest dose, only 600 milligrams a day. This is not a randomized trial. People knew they were getting the drug. There's no control group. But 15 out of 22, one person and dropped out had a complete or partial response. In the graph, the dark bars are the responders, people who got better. The shaded bars are people who did not get better. And regardless of how people describe their pain, people with MS can have various different pain syndromes. With the exception of dull, aching pain, most people reported improvement. In terms of side effects of the drug, most people don't have major side effects
effects at low doses, but at higher doses it can be sedating. And that's the rub. Someone might take 300 milligrams three times a day and it's not very effective. They try to increase it and it's effective, but it's too sedating. And because of that, some people try unusual dosing regimens like 300 in the morning and afternoon and 900 at night just because they don't like the side effects. It can also cause dizziness and gastrointestinal upset like nausea and pedal edema or swelling at the ankles, though usually mild and only with higher doses. People can have allergic reactions to gabapentin, such as angioedema, swelling of the lips and throat, which can be quite dangerous, along with anaphylaxis, though this is uncommon. There's also a drug reaction causing skin and other allergic reactions called dress syndrome. Now, most people don't have major mood side effects, though suicidal ideation or thoughts of suicide has been reported. One study suggested an 80% increased risk. I haven't personally seen a lot of this. It's also been reported that gabapentin may have some potential for tolerance and abuse and misuse. It's actually been used as a street drug in high doses, and some people can have difficulty coming off of it. It's actually recommended to wean off slowly to reduce the risk of a withdrawal syndrome, which can even cause seizures in rare instances, especially with higher doses like 900 or 1200 milligrams three times daily. That being said, I think the risk of abuse is overstated for some with chronic pain who needs relief, they should know the risk of something like gabapentin is much lower than something like opioids. They're not even really in the same phylum, in my opinion. For people with chronic kidney disease, the dose of gabapentin is different. It's lower because the kidneys excrete gabapentin. So this is a chart looking at creatinine clearance, a measure of kidney function, and you can look up your own creatinine clearance using a calculator online. If it's normal, greater than 6 the typical doses are 900 to 3600 milligrams daily, and these symbols stand for TID, or three times a day, BID, twice a day, or QD, once a day. So for example, someone with a low creatinine clearance of only 15, they might start by just taking 100 milligrams once a day. Also, gabapentin is a dialyzable drug, meaning after you have hemodialysis, it takes out the drug, and so you have to get a supplement, or the effect will go away very quickly. And I typically recommend just taking the same dose as a supplement. So if you're on hemodialysis and you take 100 milligrams of gabapentin once a day, you can take an additional tablet after hemodialysis just to get your levels up so you don't have pain right afterwards. Gabapentin does have a few known drug-drug interactions. For instance, hydrocodone, a weaker opioid, one of the ingredients of Norco, the levels are slightly reduced in people taking gabapentin. So it may be a little bit less effective. You can take it with gabapentin. It may be just not quite as strong. Also, Malox, the antacid, reduces the absorption of gabapentin by around 20% so it's preferred to avoid taking Maalox within two hours of gabapentin. If you've taken gabapentin, please share in the comments below what nerve pain syndrome do you have? Did gabapentin work for you? And what dose did you take? And did you have any side effects? And if it didn't work, what else did you try that was successful? And let me know if you have ideas for other videos.